best clue. Can you um, inform our viewers a little bit about the whole idea of ID, um, idea and ID, idea of IDing people? I mean, it starts with we, you know, we've heard about. They may have heard about the premises ID for animals and stuff, but tell them, you know. As far as keeping the indiv the individual and the rights of the individual sovereign, and how it's an attack on that when they start um, forcing people to, you know, have an RFID. I think one of the big threats that we face is we're seeing sort of a convergence between the corporations and the government, kind of working together to find out more and more about the public. And so you'll see this on the commercial side, the frequent shopper card that people present without thinking about it is making a detailed record of everything you purchase going back in some cases 10 or 15 years. They know if you have a cat, they know if you have a baby, they know if you have a 10 year old, they know what hours you work, they know, uh, they may even know what line of your work you're in. It's amazing what they can do with, with data mining. So you see sort of that on the corporate side, these massive databases being amassed on consumers for marketing purposes. And then you couple that, that sort of increasing thirst or, 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 you know, it's almost like the wolves smell blood when it comes to our data. And then on the government side, since September 11th, we're seeing the same push to get that kind of information into those databases. And so you're seeing sort of the two, unfortunately, kind of moving together to the same place. And on the government side, Real ID, mm -hmm. the National I uh, Driver's License, or the National Identification System through these state driver's licenses that would be consolidated, that's really how the government is going to push that angle. No longer will it be you simply talk to the state of New Hampshire or Massachusetts about who you are. Now you're going to be talking to the federal government about who you are, and all that gets consolidated. Now, the thing that's got me especially worried right now is that the Department of Homeland Security is getting very much involved with the state driver's licenses even now, even before we've gotten to the real ID point. Uh, give you an example, they're working with the state of uh, Washington right now, and 35,000 Washington citizens now have been issued ID cards for border crossing to simplify their getting over the border into Canada that contain remotely readable microchips. Uh, RFID tags in them hmm. that can be read from 20 feet away. And they've been issued these cards without any discussion of their potential for tracking, of their potential for uh, abuse, of their potential for Big Brother intrusions. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this is particularly worrisome in light of the fact that last year the nation of China was the biggest RFID market on the globe. And the reason for that is they issued one billion RFID tagged identity documents or identity cards to every citizen of China. Every single person within their borders is required by law now to carry one of these remotely readable microchips. And on their cards, they've encoded things like not just your name and your address and your date of birth, but they've also encoded your educational history, your health history, your criminal history, your employment history, even the name and phone number of your landlord. And so you could be walking down the street of China and a Chinese communist official could simply run a scanner near you without even your knowledge and read this thing right through your right through your pocket or your purse or your backpack or your wallet without your knowledge. So and so here's a, here's a government, the Chinese government, who harvests their own people's organs. <laughs> so not only in that information would they have things like, hmm, my blood type. Yeah. And so let's say they were just shopping for a liver. Let's say they had utilized their liver to such an extent that they destroyed it. So as they're walking through the crowd, this government official could turn around and get his goons to say, get that man. You, you, He's you got my liver. Yeah. And no, I, I know, it sounds, it sounds, it sounds far-fetched, but as you said, whether it's the Department of Homeland Security, this is just one database and one application. Um, many other uh, databases reside out there, and also there are many other applications. That, right. that sounds as far-fetched and maybe almost Orwellian of, gee, would the world ever come to that? But people who harvest other people's organs, they don't care about people. Right. That's not a people caring place. And to find that we're following the footsteps of, let's say, IBM and Hitler, where we should know not only your religion, but your age, do you have any trades, your health conditions, so that we can put you either in work camp A or in population reduction camp B. You know? Um, well, let, me, hmm. let me speak of IBM, because uh, you, you brought up the yeah. IBM and the Holocaust, their involvement in, in facilitating the Holocaust. What few people realize is that IBM holds a patent for something they've developed called the Person Tracking Unit. Uh, great name, isn't it? PTU. They, yeah, okay, hang on. The, the PTU. PTU the person Tracking Unit. And uh, they're, they're, they've developed this Person Tracking Unit for the day when all of our belongings, including our driver's licenses, have these remotely readable microchips. And uh, for, for people who aren't familiar with this, it's possible to embed an RFID microchip into the soles of your shoes. Into anything. Weave it into your clothing. They can put it, uh, into drop anything. it into the mold when they're creating something made of plastic. Mm -hmm. they're, they're small and they're easily hidden and there are companies that specialize in hiding them right now 
major retailers across the country are starting to experiment with this. And embed them in products. Embedding them in and products. And so not only would you get a package of cereal back from the store, but it'd be like a serialized package of cereal. A package of cereal that actually has, once again, that ID. Right. And the radio frequency part is just, hey, I put a detector in that, once again, I got a very small antenna, and the antenna can be below nanometer. And with a small amount of energy, it'll be enough to energize the chip. The chip will do what? It'll send back yeah, a the, number the, back well, to the, the reader. Yeah, the tracking unit's the best way to understand it. What they envision with this person tracking unit, it's actually the reader that picks up all of these, these mm -hmm. signals that you would be carrying around with you. And it's, a, it's an RFID reader device that sends out a kind, kind of a constant set of bursts of electromagnetic energy. And if you had one of these tags in your shirt, burst, 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 that energy would be picked up and then beamed back exactly. to the... Exactly. It energizes the chip that allows it to transmit. And so you put one of these in a doorway, you walk through the doorway, and every object on your person can be read, and because radio waves travel right through clothing and plastic mm -hmm. and leather, they can read everything in my purse, everything in your backpack, everything in your suitcase, and read that all as you walk right through, thus doing not only an inventory of your stuff, but also tracking where you go. So IBM's person tracking unit is a notion of putting these things into public spaces, putting them into walls and floors and ceiling tiles and shelving and everywhere else you go. And the list of places they wanted to put this was truly shocking. They want to put it in airports, bus stations, train stations. They want to put it into shopping malls, sports arenas, museums, theaters, libraries, even elevators and public restrooms. And think of what would happen if we were, by any stretch of the imagination, ever to get criminals in our government. <laughs> <laughs> and you would give this type of power and yeah. information to yeah. a criminal. Think, of the, think that might ever happen? I, has it ever happened yeah, before? Well, no. Well, IBM certainly has experience with working with criminal governments, doesn't it? Very much yeah. so, and not just that. Prof, excuse me, profiting from them. And it's funny when you said the merger of a um, almost like a corporacy or a, a corporate state or a, cor a group of corporations who turn around and say we can not only make money from this, we can sell contracts for this. Maybe this is where we can spend our money, or you know, defense money, or whatever. Who would you think in the nation of China? Who who would be providing? in the technology for this. You know, some horrible Chinese communist government technology laboratory somewhere, no. It was American companies. IBM, Cisco, Dell, Hewlett Packard. These were all the companies working with the Chinese Communist government to issue these tracking devices that are mandatory for all Chinese citizens to carry around with them. Well, it's funny. Now when you take Google, okay, and you say, well, gee, Google provides for China search engines, and Google does what? Google censors for China now. They get paid to actually censor to reduce the amount of information that their people could see. That maybe that information would show that they're harvesting people's organs. I mean, right there, is that bad enough for you people? People, yet, yeah, really. yet, they're, yet they're doing a, a PR campaign this week or last week yes, called the Olympics, worse. which was, you know what, brought to us by Hitler or whatever. It's a whole other story. But um, first off, you came here. You found people that were not only interested in liberty and freedom, okay, but had an awareness of what was going on in the world. That's got to make you feel good. Uh, I, I love this movement. I mean, the freedom movement, the people in this movement are some of the most intelligent, articulate, well-informed, and i got to say it, optimistic people that I know. How many people at this event do you think are on antidepressants? How many people <laughs> at this event do you think exactly. have kids on Ritalin? How many people at this event are, are, are in that sort of downtrodden go home and sit in front of the TV and vegetate till you pass out kind of a mode? Nobody. You know, I look at this crowd and I say, you know, we're the ones actually looking reality straight in the eye, acknowledging it for what it is and working to make it better. And we don't need to drug ourselves. We don't need to to put ourselves to, you know, into a state of zombified stupefaction, we can actually look at the reality. And I, I'm hoping that as more and more people wake up to this reality, that we can start getting away from all of that self-medication with television and video games and, and all the things that people are using so they don't have to think. I always try to tell the viewers and stuff, and that is that there's a reason they call it programming. <laughs> Okay. Well put. Always ask the question of the people, why do they call That's it right. programming? Absolutely. 